Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Lessons of the Vietnam Show. Here we strive to tell the real stories of the Vietnam War and the men and women who served uh, in that war. It's important to us to dispel the many myths, mistruths, misunderstandings, and downright lies of the, of the war and its participants. I am Bill Dixon, Vietnam veteran, 1967-1968, TET survivor, and your host for the show. Uh, we broadcast from the uh, International Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina of Nissan Communications. Uh, you should check out some of his other shows. And if you're on the screen there, you can see how to see the show live. Uh, or you can also go back and see it on demand at any time. It gives you the information there about how to call in and be part of the show. We invite always for you to call in and ask our guest or your host uh, anything that uh, you need to know or want to know or make a comment and so forth. So, uh, Tell your friends about the show and uh, tell your friends if we get everything right. If we get anything wrong, it's very important that we get it right. So uh, let me know if you if I say something or the guest says something that you have a problem with. Uh, I'll be glad to research it and get you an answer or ask, ask our guest. As you can see there, we're always worried about our uh, veterans out there. They, uh, they keep telling us there's 22 a day uh, who commit uh, suicide and so forth. And if you are a veteran and you uh, feel depressed or, or, or need some help, call that number. And if you know a veteran, please uh, encourage them to call that number. We need to stop that. Uh, today is uh, also an interesting day. Today is the anniversary of the day that Richard Nixon told us that he was going to resign the next day at noon. Now, that announcement of his resignation probably affected the uh, Vietnam War and the outcome of the war uh, more than most people ever think about. Uh, when, he, uh, when he resigned and left, the North Vietnamese did a lot of uh, things. Uh, the POW issue was kind of thrown out of the way. So uh, we'll talk about that sometime in the show. Now, we, tonight, we have a very special guest. Uh, he's going to be talking about his new book, uh, Thunder, the Stories uh, of the first tour, uh, Lieutenant Colonel John J. G. Jack Heslin and his book. And Jack, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you start talking and tell everybody about that fantastic book you got. You sent it to me. I've read it. Uh, once I put it, I started, it was hard for me to put down. I uh, had some great stories in there and uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to uh, you tell us about it tonight and be sure to write down Thunder because uh, you can go online and, and buy it. I know you want to buy at least one copy for you and one for a friend. Uh, if you don't have a friend, buy a copy and give it to them to become a friend. <laughs> All right, Jack, go ahead. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, it's my second time on your show, and uh, I really appreciate all you're doing for all of us who served. Uh, your work is monumental. And um, again, I thank you for allowing me to come on this show to talk about my book. Uh, Thunder, Stories from the First Tour. It was a very painful book for me to write. Um, interestingly, I was able to do the Battle of Contum and launch that website in 2002. And Contum, the East Offensive, that website is based on my second tour. Many people ask me, Jack, what about your first tour? What happened? And my answer always was, I'm not ready to talk about that. I just couldn't. It was just too painful, too many memories, too hot. It's taken 50 years. In fact, this is the 50th anniversary right now of my first tour, which was October of 1967 to October of 1968, which brought me in Vietnam through the Tet Offensive. The book is designed and was written to tell the story as best as I could remember it and with as much documentation as I have. It started in the early spring, this past early spring, when a friend of mine called me and said, Jack, um, I'm trying to answer a question. He was also in the 119th Assault Helicopter Company, but before me. And it was about units with the 119th in terms of the platoons. So because I was trying to research that and give him an honest answer, I went into my records and I have a 
considerable amount of records. Can we have the next slide? See if that uh, if that comes up. Pull back up the next slide. Next yeah. slide up would be good. There it is. Thank you. Um, I have about two feet of military records, and I came about those because the military, the army, was converting all our military records to digital, and they contacted us and said, "If you want to have your paper copies, the hard copies, uh, they'll send it. You you pay for the the postage, so to speak." And I said, "I want them," and so they send a big box came to me, and all my records were in it, which I then carried around for quite a while. So I had those records and to answer my friend's question, I went into them and going into them, I realized I had a tremendous amount of information there, detailed information to include all my flight records, every flight record I had starting in flight school. Um, I had all the awards in deck, all my efficiency report, every order, general order, special that was cut on me, everything was there including witness statements for some of the actions I was involved in. Well, it was like a dam broke. Uh, after 50 years, my wife and children will tell you that I did not, and I could not talk much about my first tour. But when that dam broke, I said, I've got to write it down. I've got to get it going. And I needed to do it for me. I needed to tell a story. I always tell veterans, Tell your stories. Don't wait till you're dead and your kids are wondering what you did. They want to know. So you tell your stories. So I'm answering, you know, I'm doing my own, following my own advice. And I started writing. And it was like, as I said, a dam broke. And it just started to come out of me. And as I went through the process, it was surprising to me that when I thought I'd be feeling those huge emotional waves that would strike me when I used to think about it, so much of that had subsided. I think the writing of the Battle of Khantoum was hugely cathartic for me and helped me a great deal. So I started writing. And then the next question, of course, was, okay, Jack, now we're going to write this story. How do you structure it? What do you emphasize? What do you tell? What don't you tell? And I've read many Vietnam books, and many authors do their best, but oftentimes the reader doesn't realize they're actually reading fiction. The author did a, a great job, but they could not remember. Um, I'm surprised when some authors come up with enormous detail, even their political positions, um, from 40 years ago, 30 years ago, pick a time. I just could not go there. In fact, in my book, I said, I'm not going to quote anything unless I have an absolute certainty that I was there. So I started structuring it and the theme of it, of the book evolved into a sequential tour. And during that tour, I came in, I described, first of all, I call it the first chapter, the long journey to Vietnam, which is background on me and how I came to come in the military through my education and ROTC, my early years, and then my marriage and my first entry into the military where I went to the 82nd Airborne Division and um, Dominican Republic. And then while there, I got a colonel that suggested I go to flight school. And I tell all the details of that, which then brings me to being assigned to a, a unit being deployed. To Vietnam, which was the 57th assault helicopter company. And as soon as I got into country with them, um, there was a program of infusion where they take new units coming in and they take a third of them, roughly a third, and they put them in other units and take more experienced people from other units into the new unit. So this is uh, not only a, uh, a level of experience, but not everybody will be leaving at the same time. So I came into the 119th Assault Helicopter Company. And in my book, I write about that experience and um, becoming a platoon commander, what that meant, and the kinds of things that we did. And one of the parts of that that was really important for me early on 
was that I learned that I thought I knew how to fly a helicopter. I came out of flight school with very high grades for flying. However, when I got in Vietnam, I learned very quickly that in fact, um, the type of combat flying you had to do in Vietnam was way different. You were always going to be at the edge. It required every bit of skill you had. It required total concentration. And I remember in the first in-country orientation flight I had, I flew with a young warrant officer and we were flying a mission that was basically an administrative mission, not a combat assault mission. So I could get oriented to the procedures. I could get oriented to the AO, the area. And I met the young warrant officer down on the flight line. I was a first lieutenant at the time. And I remember walking up to him as we were going down to pre-flight the ship. And uh, I looked at him and he was just this kid. I mean, he was just this little, looked like a little kid. But when I looked in his eyes, he looked like an old man. He looked like an old man. I said, what happened to him? Well, it didn't take long for me to figure out that the white hot fire of combat in Vietnam will turn anybody into an old man. And that's what happened. That's what happened to all of them. My experiences flying were not unlike other helicopter pilots. And when you read the book, and I really hope you do. The things you read in there about things I was involved in, things I did, I want you to remember. There were thousands of young helicopter pilots. Most of them were warrant officers. They faced the same kinds of things I did. They did the same kinds of things I did. They're very, very unrecognized for what they did those many years ago. Jack, I want to interrupt you just a minute. Yeah. You talk about it a little bit in the book, but uh, what I know about helicopter flying, it requires the use of both hands, feet, and your mind, co total co concentration, especially to hover and land. When bullets are striking the helicopter in the bubble that you're in, uh, how do you keep concentration in maintaining the helicopter position in order for them to unload, uh, unload troops or loading the wounded on and unloading surprise? I, you know, it, I can't understand how in the world a man can sit there and not flinch every time a bullet hits that shield. Uh, and if you flinch too much, you're going to cut somebody's head off. It's uh, <laughs> Y'all did a phenomenal job, and you go over it a little bit in the book. But I would like for, for uh, you to tell our audience a little bit about uh, how you did that, and uh, then they can read the book as a follow-up. Well, Bill, um, every one of us had our own way of maintaining our composure, our focus. Everybody had their own techniques of doing that. I got to tell you, quite frankly, and people have asked me many times after reading the book, when there was uh, so many times I should have been dead. My wife calls it the book of seconds and inches because there were so many times that's what kept me alive. And I can't, I got to tell you, honestly, it, come, it came down from me. Um, I was totally, it was a life of faith. I was a believer. I am a believer. I absolutely had to trust that my life would be spared and that it was. Now, when my son became a helicopter pilot, and I was really happy after 20 years to put my original flight wings on him, my advice to him was, the advice I followed myself, do your job. Focus on what you're doing. It's impossible to describe the absolute pandemonium of exploding bombs and gunfire and everything going on around you. The screeching engine, the roar, the, the, the headset alive with chatter and to maintain your focus. You're on a thin edge all the time of maintaining control. And the only way to do that, no matter how fearful you felt, was to stay totally focused on what you were doing. Because oftentimes, that cyclic control in your hand was in your fingertips. If somebody was watching you, they couldn't even see it move. You had to stay totally focused because you were so much on the edge. And the 
thin edge was between what I describe in my book as fear, which is your friend, and panic, which will kill you. And when I say fear is your friend, it heightens all your senses. It makes you totally aware of everything around you. Whereas panic, which is just over the line, you're paralyzed. You don't know what to do. You're done. So that's the best way I can describe it. And I did have one incident where one of my pilots came to me and said, I just can't fly anymore. I'm a magnet ass. I've been hit every time for the last two weeks and I can't go up again. Well, people didn't realize that people, a lot of people don't realize pilots are all volunteers. Nobody can force a pilot to climb in a ship and fly. Anytime he wants to, he can say, I'm not going. I can't do it anymore. And that's the end of it. Well, in this particular case, this young warrant officer, um, I replaced him in the ship and then came back in from the mission and I sought him out. And without going into a lot of detail, we had a rather lengthy conversation. I don't quote it exactly in the book, but I tell the gist of it. And it basically boiled down to an understanding of how fearful he was and that we were all, I was as fearful as he was. Yes, he had a wife and child. I had a wife and two children when expecting a third. We were all scared, but we had to do our jobs. And I said to him, I said, if this breaks you, if you back away from this, you will live with this the rest of your life. It will be a ghost that will haunt you. He thought about that a lot. We talked a little bit more about our personal lives. And I said, I'm scheduling you in the morning. I expect to see you at first light. You're flying with me. He showed up. He was great. He did a great job. Nobody ever challenged him again. He spent the rest of his tour and he went home. Safe to his family. Jack, would you say that something could happen to any, any pilot? Absolutely. Absolutely. People say, Jack, you got all these awards. You did this. You did that. Thank you, God. I lived through it. That was my thinking. But I can tell you right now, anybody can be a lion today and tomorrow a lamb. You just never know who's showing up. Um, I don't mean that to be frivolous. I'm just saying that all of us have a point where that fear can cross the line and take control of us as panic. And I, I saw it. I heard it. I was on that edge many times myself. I'm just enormously thankful I did not cross over. Um, so, so yes. your fellow pilots and his fellow pilots uh, basically said, for the grace of God, there goes I, and, did, and, and just accept him right back. I can tell you absolutely I said that. I said that. Now, some, I'm sure, did the same thing. Some felt that way. Um, others, I don't know what strategies they had to, to handle stress. I can tell you my first tour, I didn't drink at all. Um, I didn't, I mean, I hung around if they had a little show somewhere I could go see, I saw it, uh, but I was not drinking. Um, I knew that that would be the wrong choice to handle stress for me. So yeah, the grace of God. Now, after I've gotten through that, I realized the rest of my life, okay, I'm alive. What are you going to do with it? So I'm hoping as I approach my 75th birthday that my life counts for something, that the world is a little better because I'm here and that I was allowed to be here as I am now. Thank you. I, uh, I have in the book a picture of my wife and me when we got married in 1965. And uh, Jean is an extraordinary woman. We've been married more than 53 years. And in my book, while it is my first tour, stories from my first tour, it was my wife's first tour. And I cannot stress enough the strength, the power, of that woman during that period. She endured things you just would never expect anyone to have to endure. She had two children. She was pregnant with a third child. Our oldest child required surgery. She was alone. It wasn't like today with support groups. 
She was 24 years old like me. She was a registered nurse. She's a very smart woman, very capable, very independent. But she realized that the children totally depended on her keeping it together. And in the, in the book, you will see insights into who Jean is. She still is today. And she was then, especially the incident where she sees a military and army sedan pull up to the front of the house, two uniformed soldiers come out and she answers the door with two small children wrapped around her legs and deep into a pregnancy. And they walk up to the door and ask her, are you Mrs. Heslin? She about passed out. Well, it turns out they were there to check furniture damage that she'd put in for damage we had to furniture. She about fell down, they grabbed her, put her in a chair, and she said, my husband's in Vietnam, and they were very, very apologetic. And that's just one indicator of the kinds of things that Jean went through. I was very delighted that my, my children, after reading the book, said, Dad, I'm so glad in the book. It, it reflects our mother, who is such an extraordinary human being. And one of my sons said, gee, Dad, your book's thunder. She ought to write a book, Waiting for the Lightning. <laughs> well, yeah, Jack, I want to uh, jump in here. Uh, the, 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 thing I, the, the big thing I think is you're still married. 53 years and uh, counting. I was married three years. When I went to Vietnam, we were getting ready to have our 54th anniversary. Well, congratulations. And uh, I, I know what it was like for her while I was in Vietnam. Yeah. You know, you see on the news of... Uh, Five soldiers killed today in yeah. Vietnam, yes. and you got a loved one over there. Your yeah. heart stops beating, yeah. uh, waiting for that van of drive that sedan to drive up, and yeah. those two guys walk up. I can't imagine uh, what she felt when she looked out the window and saw those two guys. Yeah. I just, I mean, I think I would have shot them. Uh, yeah, well, um, as I said, she's an amazing woman, and. Um, and then we had an older son have to go through surgery. And um, the, you read the book and you'll see many of the insights. None of us did it alone, folks. In Vietnam, we never did it alone. I was always part of a crew. Anything you read in that book about me and you say, how in the heck did he do that? Just remember, I had a crew on board with me. I had a gunner, a crew chief, and I had another pilot. Anything I was going through, they were going through. And I can remember him one very bad day and we were taking a lot of hits. I actually said, and my pilot had uh, some flesh wounds on his face. He was bleeding. And I said to the crew, do we keep going? And they all said, yes, because we were going in to save people that were wounded. And we just kept rolling down there. But everybody was on board. And people don't realize the intensity of the crew relationship. You absolutely depended on your crew chief, your, your enlisted crew chief and door gunner to keep you alive. And we were all a team all the time. And in my introduction to my book, I try to recognize that those that served with me, especially in the 119th Assault Health Company, they were all heroes. They were all heroes, every single one of them. And I would not be here today if it wasn't for their actions. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, in the book, you also get a picture of my wife and our, our family. If you pull up the next slide, there is one thing I want to point out. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a picture of me at Fort Walters, Texas, when I first was in flight school. And that's my oldest son, John, in my arms. And behind me is an OH-23D. At that time, Fort Walters was the most uh, busy. It was the busiest um, airport in the world. Every time they launched and recovered literally thousands of helicopters, it was amazing to see. They looked like, you know, they looked like locusts up there in the air. And in my book, I talk about my very first day in flight school where I had, there were two students, me and my stick buddy and a young instructor pilot. And he said, who wants to go first? And I said, I do. That'd be great. I went out for an orientation flight with him, came back and he took my stick buddy, the other guy, they went out, they ran into a tree near the browser. So they were killed instantly. They were dead. And so my wife and the other wives knew there'd been a fatality, but nobody knew who. 
until I came home at 11.30 that night. One more case where my wife had to deal with something and she had a little child, John. And I said to her, and many, not many, but a number of guys quit. And I said, I want to continue. And she said, do it, do it. You stay with it. And I stayed with Brian. So that's Fort Walters, Texas. Um, I don't know if we want to look at the um, another slide here. Oh, okay. Okay. If you then you go to the next one. Okay. This slide, of course, got the, the picture of Thunder. I mean, the picture of the book. And Bill, I'm really glad you keep the picture up there of Thunder. I hope your audience has got a good view of it by now. I don't want anybody when we get through <laughs> say, what was, the, what was the name of that book? Yeah. I'm very pleased if you go on Amazon right now, there are two wonderful reviews on it. And um, they're also uh, on, um, on uh, Barnes and Noble. There's only one renew. Uh, there's only one review on, ba on Barnes and Noble, by the way. And it simply says every American should read this book <laughs> anyway. Um, so this is a picture of, um, uh, of course, the helicopters and some of the missions that were flown there. Did something you want to add to that, Bill? No, I just uh, wanted something along with the book. Yeah. And then um, if we go to the next slide, this is a picture uh, of me. Actually, this was at the latest stages of Fort Rucker, Alabama, when I was in flight school. And um, on that, and whenever you UH, UH1H helicopter. Which one are you? I'm the one standing on the right. The, the man on the sitting inside on the far left is my friend, Dan Baker. Dan Baker. Uh, in, in the middle was um, Dave Raymond. Uh, when I went to Vietnam, I went to the 119th. Dan Baker went to the 4th Division. And he was in a, in a unit, I think the Gamblers. He was a gun pilot. And um, he actually got shot down. I went to see him in the 71st of back. Dan was a, he was a great guy. And um, he wasn't in life-threatening injuries, but he ended up going back to the States. And then he got out of the military. And he, been very successful in California. I'm still in contact with him. Um, but that gives you a little view of the UH-1. And the, the next slide that comes up will give you a picture of me sitting in a UH-1. And um, there I've got my pipe in my mouth. <laughs> that pipe went with me everywhere. I then converted to cigars because I couldn't throw the pipe out the window when it got really bad. I could chomp down on a cigar. But anyway, that's me. Plus, you have to continue to light a pipe. Uh, that's right. It got to be a real pain. You know, but, I, I'm gentlemen, yeah. those of you out there in the audience, if you hear rumbling in the background, uh, that's for authenticity. It's actually a thunderstorm that's passing over, but it, it sounds like incoming off in the distance. So we just put that in there, a little bit of authenticity, so that yeah. would feel better. Thanks. We got some homegrown thunder. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh -oh, playing. I it's, think it's coming in. It's now. playing in. Yeah, thunder in the. People ask me how did I come up with the uh, title of the book. That's hot right there. Um, the, the ubiquitous helicopters in Vietnam were known for the sound of the blades, and I call it thunder. And in fact, the entire Vietnam War was nothing but a cacophony of man-made thunder between explosions and this and that. I mean, it was just loud all the time. So I picked up the name thunder for obvious reasons. And when I think about and I say it in the book, when the American soldiers heard the thunder of the blades, they felt good. They knew help was on the way. Their way out was on the way. If they were wounded, somebody was going to come. If they needed water, somebody was bringing the water or ammunition. But the enemy, when they heard thunder, they knew that they were terrified because they knew what was coming. Which I got's a lonely feeling to be out there in the jungle with the bad guys out there and the sound of those blades, like somebody's out there backing yeah. me up. Somebody cares. Yeah. It, it's just, it's unbelievable the the feeling that uh, uh, those of us who are on the ground going, oh my God, here they come. Yeah. We we need, we got some, you know, even if it's ham and lima beans, we, at least we got some food coming in and some take our wounded out and some more ammunition or whatever it was. Uh, it was a blessing just to hear that sound. And well, today, Bill, everybody, all Vietnam vets hear that sound and they just get that feeling. Well, Bill, I'm going to tell you I'm honored sitting here beside you because you were the reason we flew. You guys in the ground, you were the ones fighting. You were down in the jungle. 
You were trying to stay alive and do the mission. We were there to support you. Everything focused on the grunt. Everything focused on the guy on the ground. You had the tougher road to hold. And I'm really honored to be sitting beside, and I always appreciate the service. I don't know. I think most of us on the ground would, uh, would say that uh, you're sitting there with bullets flying all around trying to help us. Uh, you had more guts than, than we had <laughs> right. by any means, and your job was tougher than ours. I, well, you know, at least we can hide behind a, uh, a tree or a bush well, or hide in elephant grass, but uh, yeah. you're sitting there, you're kind of like a magnet. Well, you're, you're kind of saying that it was, uh, it was at times we thought we were, and we said magnet ass because we, a lot, m many, many helicopter pilots while on their, on their tour, one, two, three tours, mm -hmm. took hits on the helicopter. The Huey was an incredible machine that could take a lot and sustain a lot of damage. It's amazing. Could take a lot of hits and not come down. And it could take one hit and come down, depending on where they got hit. And, and th those, uh, th the shell of a Huey, it's not bulletproof, is it? <laughs> no, it is not. It is, um, it was very thin. Now you sat, and if you saw that picture of me sitting in the cockpit of the Huey, you'll see I'm sitting in an armored seat. And that armored seat, was beneath our butt and around us. And there was a slide just to my right elbow, a piece could be pulled forward. And that kind of a ceramic, ceramic type material would stop a small arms, AK 47, a round of that nature. And, um, it would not stop a 51 caliber or anything higher, but we felt good in that, um, in that armored seat. So the armored seats were there, the crew chief and door gunners, we all had what we call chicken plates. They were they were ceramic plates that we wore on our chest. Oftentimes, our crew chief and gunner ended up sitting on them because they did not have armor back there. The only well, other, if you think about where the bullets are coming from, sitting on them is probably a better, <laughs> a better use of them because uh, bullets most of the time were coming up from the from the ground, and yes. sitting on it was probably yes. It uh, and and in fact, for our crew chief and 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 uh, gunners, that's what they did. Now, I'm glad we've got this slide up because I I'm watching the time and I'd like to talk about this for a minute. Um, the three things I really wanted to talk about, we may not get to all of them tonight, but again, I'm, I'm um, so thankful to be here. This is uh, John Plaster's, the cover of John Plaster's book, 1967, SOG. Most Americans never knew what SOG, never heard of SOG. It stood, the initial stood for Studies and Observation Group, which was a cover name for a special forces top secret mission run into Laos and Cambodia along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. At the time, it was all top secret, and those of us that flew in support of the special forces were sworn to secrecy. We could not talk about it to anyone, not my family, anyone. And it wasn't until 1997 when Blaster released this book. I bought the book, and I stayed up all night reading it. I could not believe there it all was, everything. I flew the SOG mission. <clears throat> I went up early and I flew. I started flying with the 189th in November of 1967. I went up early because I was going to take over the mission as air mission commander <clears throat> in my platoon. And um, when I got there, I started to learn what this mission was. And it basically was the special forces teams made up of usually two Americans and four or five uh, indigenous personnel, they were mostly mountain yards, hill people, mountain people. And those slight teams, small teams, would be inserted into Laos and Cambodia along the Ho Chi Minh Trail to do reconnaissance, report back, because everyone knew that the North Vietnamese were flowing all their troops and equipment down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And in spite of it supposed to being neutral, and they're denying they were there, and the reporters and everybody believing that they weren't there. We were there, and we could see they were coming down by the thousands. Well, these SOG teams, these Special Forces men, were absolutely amazing. I, I look at movies. People make these war movies, and I'm saying, you guys don't know what it is. These Special Forces guys, they hung it out totally in their mission, totally unrecognized. At that special forces camp I was with at uh, FOB2, which was the central location as opposed to the south and up north, I, I knew Bob Howard, 
Robert Howard, who was a Medal of Honor winner, a retired colonel eventually. He was a sergeant when I was there. I knew Fred Zabatowski. I flew him, Medal of Honor winner. Streets named after him at Fort Bragg. Many of the others that were did extraordinary things. Just you can't believe the extraordinary things they did. And they don't get credit for it. Most Americans have no idea that these men risked every single day, everything, on a little tiny unit. They knew we put them in. They knew we had to take them out because they could not get out without us. Jack, let me interrupt you right there. I think the audience needs to understand that this small group of men are dropped off, surrounded by thousands of the enemy, and there ain't no Americans close by. Nobody. They can't even get artillery. Everything they have is on their back. That's exactly right. They if carry they're it in. thirsty, they better take it with them. And if they're food or and the ammunition, they better take it with them because there is no supply. It may be a pickup when they need it, but there is no supply, and they're totally out there surrounded, and their job is to not to be seen so they can uh, study what's going on. But yeah. these men are out there totally on their own, the small group yes. surrounded with everything they have to use, yes. food, water, ammunition, medicine. They were uh, and they're putting up with the snakes, the heat, the spiders, yeah. the mosquitoes. They were, uh, yeah, they were the often terrain. 20 or 30 kilometers inside Laos or Cambodia. And now some of the teams were larger, maybe 40 men, sometimes a little larger. And I write about it in my book. We called them Hornet Forces. Their mission, when they, we put them in, were really a combat assault to interdict the trail, um, to find units and, and uh, supply dumps and destroy those supply dumps. Of course, every time we put anybody in, the North Vietnamese reacted right away and, um, and tried to uh, destroy them, eliminate them. And so often, almost every time we were picking them up or going out to pull them out, we were in a gunfight because they were already in a gunfight and running for their lives when we found them and we finally picked them up. Or they were in a, some little isolated LZ, surrounded, and no way out except if we came in and got them. And of course, to come in and get them, we had to fly through the fire. And uh, these special forces guys were just amazing. In Laos, we could have air support and we got the best air support anytime we went into Laos. Remember now, we were so far, there was no artillery support, none anywhere. When we went into Cambodia, because of the political situation, we got no air support. We had no air support, none. We had to go guns heavy. But we could not call on Air Force to support us in, in uh, Cambodia because of the political situation. I'm sorry. It was ridiculous. And the politicians, if they were there and their sons were there, it would have been a lot different. Um, men died because they could not get the support that was needed. Those Special Forces guys in SOG did an extraordinary thing, an extraordinary mission. And <clears throat> when I was there in that December and January, it was just before Tet. Well, we all knew there was this incredible amount of traffic coming down the trail. We did not know why. Saigon, everyone was trying to figure out why all the heavy traffic, what's coming down the road, what's going to happen. Nobody anticipated this, the incredible intensity of the Tet Offensive of 1968. And I was there for that also. It, it was huge. But it was not as reported in the military, I mean, in the newspapers. The Vietnamese military did a great job, took huge losses in defending their country. None of the, North, uh, the South Vietnamese units turned against the government. The civilian population did not turn against the government. They fought with courage and honor. And they just never got, a, never got the, account, the um, recognition they should have had. Well, that was part of the strategy <clears throat> of the communists that the uh, civilians were supposed to rise up and fight with them. And that was how they were going to overthrow us during Tet because, uh, and, and the civilian population uh, did not do that. That's correct. And the Vietnamese fought. Now I've heard, I've been two tours over there. I'm very connected to the Vietnamese refugee population. Mili many military people that came to this country. My best friend, one of my, one of my best friends, was General Lee Tong Ba, who since died POW for 13 years, one of the last generals fighting in 1975. 
and people don't give the South Vietnamese military, Air Force, Army, and their Navy the credit that they deserve. They just get beaten up over and over again. Americans don't realize these people grew up in war. They didn't have a D Rose. They lived their entire life in war. They were there till they died. I knew helicopter pilots and I write about them in my book. Two Vietnamese pilots, very famous, called Mustachio and, and um, Cowboy. They just kept flying until eventually they were killed. Um, we went over for a year and came home. You know, and people talk about, well, those uh, North Vietnamese soldiers were so strong and everything else. Well, tell you, tell you what, folks. They have families at home. We were bombing up north, but by policy, we were not killing a lot of civilians. I don't care what anyone tells you. Did things happen? Sure. But they weren't our target. The Vietnamese, North Vietnamese that came into South Vietnam knew at least their families were safe. But in South Vietnam, the Vietnamese, uh, the Arvin, the military, they knew their families were not safe. Their families were targets just like they were. And people don't realize their families paid a huge price. And I, I, it, 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 may, it bothers me greatly that we as Americans have never recognized that our allies, those who we spilled blood with, those who were warriors with us, we just ignored them after the war. And it, it bothers me. Now, if we could pull up another slide here for just a minute. Uh, I like that because I got the little pet monkey. Thanks so much. But that was it. I was at the, um, I was at the special forces FOB T, uh, FOB two camp. And one of the sergeants said this monkey, I thought was really neat. So he had it crawling all over me and took a picture. But was uh, he an alcoholic? Was who an alcoholic? Monkey. monkey. He may well have been on some kind of drugs. He didn't bite me. <laughs> every time I've ever heard of a, monkey, a story of somebody, a monkey, the monkey yeah. drank a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. They, I, I don't know that for a fact. Now, this next slide uh, is a picture of me in uh, December of 1970. I mean, correction, I, I, I got to keep those tours separated. 1967 at FOB2. That's my helicopter. I was the uh, Blue Platoon Commander. I was also the Air Mission Commander for my time at SOG. That aircraft, number 6616516. Uh, three days after this picture was taken, I was shot down on the Ho Chi Minh Trail trying to pull out a bunch of wounded, and that aircraft was destroyed. For uh, those of you out there, uh, when he mentioned FOB, that's Forward Observation Base. That's right. It is not, uh, it is not uh, one of the big major places. Yeah. It itself is kind of out in the jungles and, well, and so forth. Yeah, FOB-2, Forward Operating Base 2, they were, this was central. Down in the south, there was another one, uh, uh, southern. And then up north, northern uh, part of South Vietnam, there was a northern one. And these little bases, and this one was located just south of Kantum, was where the special forces teams from the 5th Special Forces, um, the SOG units, would operate out of those. And in my book, I talk quite a bit about that and the kind of missions we flew. Um, and I, I just wanted to highlight that. I would like to, um, if we, yes, this next slide that's up is, um, and I talk about uh, one of the, uh, in my book, um, little uh, mountain yard ceremonies. And the man, as you're looking at the picture, the man with the beret is the FOB2 Special Forces commander. His name was Major Roxy Hart. He was a great guy, really great guy. And as the air mission commander and the platoon commander, um, my aircraft were there and, and, the, and the, our guns, and we had a mix of guns from other companies also. But we were responding to Major's Hart, Major Hart's um, requirements and mission. Now, a lot of people, when they read the book, my book, there's a couple of missions, they say, why in the world did you do that? Why didn't you push back? The answer is you have to understand where Major Hart was. First of all, those special forces people, those teams that went into Laos and Cambodia, hung it all out, totally. Major Hart put them out there because he was ordered to do reconnaissance in very bad places. He knew that those teams out there were risking it all. He knew that they could count on him to commit us, the aviation units, to go out and save them. We put them in, we'll pull them out. So Major Hart had no choice when things were really bad than to turn to someone like me and say, go, you do it now, day or night. 
because he knew his men depended on us. He could not go out. We had to go out. And uh, I had a great deal of respect for Major Hart. Now, the other man that's short, I mean, in that picture, I don't know who he was, but I'm sitting there under this parachute for this ceremony, a little Montagnard. The Special Forces were very, very close to the Montagnards. I have heard this statement made between American soldiers, sergeants, SF, and Montagnards, and they meant every word of it. You die, I die. That's the commitment they had with each other. Well, Jack, that's why the Special Forces Association has bought a bunch of land in Ashboro, North Carolina, mm-hmm. and uh, actually have a Montagnards village there where the Montagnards live because it's very similar to the Central Highlands where they yeah. where they live. So. And uh, I, I know that, too. I, as I said, I'm very involved with many of the Vietnamese um, that are in this, com- in this country. In fact, in 1975, my wife and I took in Vietnamese refugees. Two of them lived with us for two years. One of them ended up marrying my wife's youngest sister. I talk about it in the book briefly. Um, and we stayed very close to the Vietnamese community. I always think it's amazing. There are thousands of them in this country. You never hear anybody talk about PTSD for the Arvin soldiers that are in this country. You never hear about them on drugs or hanging around or unemployed or anything. Nobody talks about them. They just fold it in. So thankful they were in this country, could make a living. And some of them, they did, took every job they could, but they did not complain. I had a man come to my house when I had General Lee Tong Ba. He was actually married to General Ba's cousin. And in North Carolina, he came and visited us, my wife and I, and we had dinner. And this man was an Air Force uh, pilot. And he, he came, when he came out of South Vietnam, the only thing he had at all, he had a one single dollar in his pocket. That's it. And when the refugees came to our house, single males, they had nothing, absolutely nothing. And one of them could hardly speak English. They did not complain. They, they cut fish. They washed dishes in the hospital. They did any job they could do to get them living. They went to school. Um, they did not live off our welfare system. They took care of each other. So, I mean, they're, they're extraordinary people. That's an un, untold story. Can we go to the next? And these guys were quite often an officer in Vietnam, uh, in Vietnam War or Viet, South Vietnamese military who came here yeah. and um, came here and did the dishes or whatever yeah. it took to survive. Oh, yeah. and, and some of them, and some of them, uh, <laughs> like the ones living with us, one of them had been an enlisted guy. Interesting story. And then the other one, actually, and I, I don't name him in my book, but I talk about him. He ended up with, he was actually a civilian. He'd been in a seminary. He then ended up going to Saigon University in 1975. He was the youngest son of a, a family of Vietnamese. He was not in the military. He had been in the university. He came out on a boat. Well, the whole story of the, the Vietnamese um, coming out, it, again, the enormity of that whole thing where so many of them went in these little small boats who either sunk at sea, thousands of them died at sea, or they were raided by pilots, I mean pirates, uh, killed, robbed, uh, women raped. It was just an unmitigated nightmare. Again, people did not know. And then in 1975, they came to this country and they went into army camps. They went into bases, reserve bases, and they would not come out of those bases until there was, in fact, a sponsor for them. They didn't just get dumped out into communities. They had to be sponsored out. Thanks for bringing up this next slide. This next slide is the wall at Camp Holloway that shows the plaques of all the killed in action crew members and others that were at Camp Holloway during the Vietnam War. And this picture was taken uh, and that that, uh, monument at the end of the war was the uh, plaques were taken off and brought back. Got the next slide. Um, next slide would be this one. If you can, there you go. Thank you. The last thing I want to kind of talk about, because we're running out of time, if it's okay with you. Um, thank you. Is um, in December, just before Christmas, 1967, 
I had uh, my brother-in-law, Bill Evans, uh, husband of my sister, Dorothy. They had seven children. He was an eighth grade high, uh, teacher in a East Hartford High School. And just before Christmas, I received a large brown envelope. And in it, it had a letter from my brother-in-law. And in the letter, he it was a very warm, loving letter towards me. But he had included 25 letters from his students. He gave his students a homework assignment, 25 of them. These were 13-year-olds. These kids were eighth grade. And he gave them a homework assignment to write a letter to a Vietnam soldier or to me. He told them about his brother-in-law, Jack, Captain Heslin, flying helicopters. These kids wrote 25 letters. Each of them wrote a letter and it came to me. Well, I was a little busy at the time and I couldn't answer all the kids, but I did answer my brother-in-law and asked him to read the letter to the kids. Well, I told you at the beginning of this broadcast that I went into my records to find information and lo and behold, what's in my records, but this envelope of 25 student letters from 50 years ago, the letters were amazing. I ended up putting all 25 as an appendix in my book. I couldn't leave any of them out. And my goal is after 50 years, this Vietnam veteran is answering the mail. I've already contacted three of those kids who are now 63 years old. And my goal is to find them, give them a signed copy of my book because they all ask, what's it like over there? Who are you? What is it like with the, the war? How is it flying helicopters? My book answers all their mail. So I'm going to give them that book. I'm also going to give them a copy of their original letter. And if you do buy my book, and I hope you do, go to the appendix and read those letters because it will give you an incredible insight into what I call the climate of opinion. These 13-year-old kids were not real sophisticated. They were smart, but they told it like it was. And I cannot tell you how many of them said to me and to in these letters, don't worry about these people that are burning their draft cards. They're only a small group. Don't worry about these students in the street. We're all behind you. These people are all nuts. And I mean, you, these kids just laid it out. And then numbers of them said, you stand there and you guys, we're so proud of you for holding back communism. We don't want communists to come to this country. And thank you so much for what you're doing. Those letters are beautiful. And if you get a chance, I think you get a, a, a real inside of what these young kids did. Now, I've contacted three of them already. They were stunned when they heard from me 50 years later. They remembered Bill Evans, their teacher, who was really nice. By the way, he died when he was 52 from cancer, left a wife and seven kids. Fortunately, they all got along, managed okay, and my sister Dorothy was able to find a wonderful husband. But these kids remember Bill Evans as a wonderful teacher. And it's a real testament to him. Testament to him. So those three now have books for me, and I'm going after the others. I might say also that I have a wonderful reporter from Brunswick County, uh, the Beacon. Uh, her name is uh, Laura Lewis, and she's uh, a wonderful person. And she's taken it upon herself on her own time to do the, the research online to help try and find some of these students. And she's been really successful. I also have the newspaper in Hartford, Connecticut, called the Hartford Current, who's contacted me. I contacted them. And they're going to run a couple of articles to include the names of all the students. So I'm optimistic. I know several of them have passed away, but I'm optimistic we'll reach them. But uh, I wanted to kind of highlight that as something different in this book. Um, when I was going to, when I started, first wrote the book, I was going to put a few representative letters in there. And then I just said, I can't do that. I got to put them all in there. So I didn't put them in the body, but I put them all in the appendix. So I, I hope if you read the book, you read those letters. Well, Jack, I think it's very important that to realize that over there, you saw the news, what was going on back here. And sometimes you wonder, what the hell am I doing over here? And those kids' letters had to have been a, a, a shot of adrenaline. Well, to, uh, they were. They were so insightful. The adults had it wrong. The kids had it right. They were saying, don't believe the news. 
It's a small percentage of Americans. It's the college kids. They said, a number of them said, it's just the college kids. Don't believe them. Don't worry about it. We're all with you. <laughs> yeah. Not what you saw in the news, folks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, our next slide there is uh, got the book, of course, we've been talking yeah. about tonight. And I know you're going to yeah. go out and get one. But I also want you to go online to the Battle of Contum. That's how it's spelled, K-O-N-T-U-M. Yeah. Uh, it is, if it is not the best, it is one of the best uh, websites out there. And it also does what this show is trying to do. It tells you what really happened in Vietnam. Not all this garbage that Ken Burns and, and, and like uh, did out there. This is the real story. And uh, I think if you're going to do some research or you're doing uh, a thing in school out there, folks, that you need to go to the Battle of Contune website and look at it. And he's got one more thing before us. So I'm going to stop. Thank you, Bill. That website, if you go to the home page, you'll see the picture you just saw, my book. If you click on that book on the home page, it'll take you to another page that has links to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and um, the uh, Outskirts Press. Um, you can buy the book. And there's also, you can download an instant download for five bucks. Uh, an electronic version of the book. So if you got a Kindle, you can get a deal. Yeah, or just, that's right. Or you can just bring it down. I mean, just download it to your computer. Oh, okay. As a PDF file. All right. Uh, I had another big question, but I don't want to uh, keep you a whole long time here. So I'm going to skip that question, uh, so forth. But uh, folks out there, I, I know you'll enjoy the book. I did. Uh, plan on buying some more copies and, and giving them out. Uh, thank you for watching our show. We had hope it had some value to it. It did for me. I thoroughly enjoyed it, especially since I've already read the book and uh, going over it again. If you wish to sh see this show again and uh, listen to Jack, and you can uh, understand when he's talking, he's very passionate about his book and his tours in Vietnam and the Vietnamese people. Uh, just log in on www.nissancommunications.com slash live. Select On Demand and choose this show. And now be sure to click on Watch Video. Because if you just click on the other one, you, all you're going to get is the audio. And you need to see Jack's shining face. So if you click on Video, you can see him and watch the show again and, and uh, share it with your friends out there. Uh, another way you can do it is go on, if you're on Facebook, is to go out there to Facebook page of Nissan Communications and click on that. And it will take you to uh he's shaking his head but that's how i like to do it that mm -hmm. way but either way you can go on there it'll be on youtube uh it will be on jack's website uh as soon as he's passed that uh five thousand dollar royalties we're gonna ask him for. <laughs> uh, so our next show will be the 22nd of august and it will be uh again talking about helicopters it'd be operation chopper which was the beginning of the uh helicopters use in the vietnam Again, thank you so much for tuning in. And Jack, I uh, can't tell you how much I've enjoyed uh, you uh, coming up tonight and, and sharing the show with us and uh, telling it like it is. That's what this show is all about, is the getting word out there. There's a lot of good books by a lot of good folks out there. And it's so hard sometimes to get the real, the real story out there because there's so much garbage. And you can go online any place and back up the research on the garbage. It's, yeah. it's easier to uh, prove that the garbage is right than it is to shoot, prove what's right is right. Mm. And uh, books like Jack's is, and, uh, is out there for that purpose. And looking forward to you on August 22nd at 8 o'clock when we get started again. Y'all have a great weekend uh, and stay dry wherever you are. And thank you very much. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net. <laughs>